Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Matt Smith, and uh, I'm with uh, Chidio, a new and innovative platform that marries celebrities and athletes, digital media, and charitable giving. But today we're here to talk about MPEG Dash and, and work for many, many months. Time again about the potential that MPEG Dash um, offers as a complementary format that brings together the various adaptive bitrate specifications that are in use in many corners of the industry today. And today's panel discussion intends to take a fresh look and, and level set today uh, and to take a look at some of the key questions that were posed when MPEG Dash really kind of came on the scene um, and explore what trends have, and have developed and what, if any, answers we found. Uh, we'll also tackle the next round of topics as we head toward mainstream adoption of Dash um, and ask questions like, what's the technical reality in terms of encoding and players? Um, who's deploying Dash? And are there any early results in? What are some of those trends? And what can we expect over the next, say, 12 months? So I'd like to introduce uh, a very great pa panel of uh, experts here in the industry, um, beginning to uh, my left and your right, uh, Kevin Towles, Senior Product Manager from Adobe. Um, so we'll stop for a second and say hi to everyone, tell them what you do and what your role is, and maybe touch a little bit on what you do with Dash at Adobe. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Kevin. Uh, I'm the product manager for media delivery at Adobe, which includes the uh, Adobe Media Server, uh, some of our content protection technologies, uh, the file formats uh, such as HTTP dynamic streaming, uh, adaptive bitrate, uh, and Dash. Uh, my core responsibilities are to help <coughs> some of the ecosystem vendors to uh, enable some of these workflows and technologies in the market to drive really great experiences for the customers. And from a customer point of view or a broadcaster point of view, be able to develop a reliable uh, workflow and playback environment for their valuable and premium content. Great. Thank you. Uh, David Price is our next panelist. He's the head of television development at Ericsson. Uh, business development. I wish it would be, be nice if it's television, but no. Television <laughs> business development, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> television. Business development. That, uh, that means uh, that I'm out there around the world trying to uh, find new uh, avenues for us to make a difference, and especially in the areas of new technology. And one key one for us is adaptive bit rates, and clearly we've got a situation today where there is no standard. We're passionate about standards. Um, joining in with uh, Dash is also HEVC, which is a new codec which we're pioneering. Um, and the two together stand to make a big difference, especially for constrained environments such as mobile video. Thank you. John Griffin is Senior Director of Online Services and Gaming with Dolby Labs. Welcome. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, I work at Dolby Laboratories. Uh, we're working with a wide range of content partners and uh, the industry at large to try to help migrate HD services, not only to improve video, but also improved audio. Um, we do a lot of work um, throughout the ecosystem, everything from our professional partners through to silicon providers and ultimately OEMs, to ensure our technology and you know, media delivery in general works end to end. And so we've been doing a lot of work more recently with Dash, including development of test vectors and technical specifications mm -hmm. to ensure you know, companies and um, standards adopting Dash can deliver great quality audio. Thank you. And last but not least on the end is not Joe Anzarillo. For those of you who know him from Major League Baseball, he hasn't transformed. But we, we have uh, uh, filling in for him. Um, for those of you familiar with the Dash community, I'll call him the godfather of Dash. Uh, Iraj, from, uh, he's the, Iraj uh, Sudagar is the principal multimedia architect for Microsoft. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I work in corporate standards at Microsoft, work with different product groups on um, deployment and product planning of the Dash. Also, been involved chairing uh, MPEG standardization in Dash. Um, also, I'm president of Dash Industry Forum, a form of 40-something uh, companies basically promoting and adapting Dash. Also involved in the different standardization efforts, consortium efforts in Dash adoption. Great, thank you. So. We're going to keep this an iterative discussion. If you have questions at some point, feel free to raise your hand and we'll try to address them. We won't hold them till the end to keep this lively and, and moving along. So let's start with you know, a talking point. Um, Dash has been hailed as, you know, like I mentioned, a great savior or a, a uniter in the industry, something that could make everyone's life easier. But uh, I think you've, you've heard different people in the industry ask if this is a reality, right? It's, it's the silver bullet theory. Um, some customers may have a, a in, incorrect perception about Dash. 
Um, there's been a great deal of hype, lots of discussion, lots of promotion, like Araj was mentioning. You've got a, a what was a promoters group has become an industry forum. But, you know, what's the reality where are we today? So um, there's a couple of questions in there, but, Kevin, I'll start with you. What's, where are we today, and, and from Adobe's perspective, um, what are your customers saying? Are some of them adopting it? Are they planning to adopt it? You know, what's, what does the, the current state of the union look like? Well, I think the, the, the best way to answer that is direct feedback from uh, broadcasters, people who will benefit mostly from MPEG Dash. And there isn't one meeting that I'm in that doesn't have Dash as part of the conversation, as some sort of segment of that conversation. It may not be the entirety of the conversation, but in every single word, it's about what is Adobe's roadmap towards, not Dash, but what is Adobe's roadmap towards making my life easier? Right? My workflow today is really hard from a broadcaster's point of view. You're making me th think about four different formats and three different DRMs and 18 different devices. It's really hard and really expensive to maintain and support that. So Adobe, what are you doing about it? And my response and our team's responses are typically our roadmap is towards Flash we may, or Dash. Sorry, they, they rhyme, <laughs> not by coincidence. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> let me reset that one, but uh, our roadmap is towards Dash, and uh, we made announcements uh, earlier this year to support that um, with, within Flash and within our uh, delivery and our protection technologies. Uh, we continue to work with ecosystem partners to um, try to make this a reality and try to um, demonstrate and provide scenarios to illustrate Dash's abilities. And I think that's the hardest part today, and one of the really most important pieces that the Dash IF, the, the industry forum, is charged with is proving its viability as a solution to um, meet the expectations of interoperability and simplified workflows. And so what Adobe is thinking about is how can we help the ecosystem get to that point and how can we uh, get the support we need from major broadcasters and operators to invest in that technology now so that we can have a system in place that ultimately will um, drive a simplified workflow. So I'll piggyback on the tail end of that statement and, and over to you, David. You work a lot with operators and service providers. Um, that's, you know, a lot of what, what Ericsson does and the, and the customers they service. Where are they with Dash? Well, they're, they're all looking at Dash and, or generally, as an adaptive bitrate um, as a means of being able to stop re provisioning for the peak usage. It's just, it's analogous, really, to the way we pioneered um, statistical multiplexing in conventional uh, television, the kind of uh, what you see today, direct TV, et cetera. That, um, it, 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 we're, we're finding ways in which, with Dash, you can provision for the mean usage. And by doing that, you only reduce the actual quality of experience just a tiny little bit. The impairment, most times, is not perceptible or certainly isn't something that is going to lower the, the, the satisfaction of the customer in receiving that. So that, that's a vital thing because the, 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 there's a lot of investment in the infrastructure for delivery. And if you can actually provision for a mean rather than a peak, then, then it makes a lot of financial savings for the operators. That, that's what they're really looking for. And I think uh, if they take that, and as I said, we'll combine that with advances in codecs, then they will be able to deliver very, very good services without excessive in, in, in infrastructure investment. John, what's, what's Dolby's uh, position here? What, talk about you know, Dolby's role and how they're helping um, with Dash adoption, and, and what are you hearing from customers with regard to um, plans and or deployments or you know, future-looking type of, of things? Sure. Um, yeah, so the way we typically engage with the market, um, you know, the first questions we typically think about with our partners is how to make the consumer experience better, and, you know, how to make it more rich um, and, you know, certainly improve the audio. And, uh, you know, from that, you know, Dash offers a lot of advantages or fragmented MP4 in general, and so we've seen a lot of, a lot of our partners looking at that. Um, one of our lead partners, Netflix, um, I think as most of you guys know, is a, is a vocal um, advocate for the Dash standard, um, has adopted Dolby Digital <coughs> Plus in Dash containers today. So um, we, we've started to get some early adoption of use of our technology for Dash delivery. Um, we're, we're also active, um, you, you know, the, um, Kevin mentioned broadcasters. We're very active with the broadcast community as well. Um, you know, Dash is, is the basis for HPV TV 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, 1.9, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20
of the live profile. It's also the basis for TNT 2.0. Um, Araj was, was joking earlier, it's, you know, kind of all, all standards kind of lead, lead to Dash in some way, shape, or form. Um, you know, obviously DEC Ultraviolet with CSF as well. So um, we've been involved in all those standards. Um, you know, part of the role we play is, on the one hand, again, you know, bring a more immersive, um, compelling experience. But on the other hand, we do a lot of work with our partners across the entire chain, from pro partners through to silicon, through to um, consumer products, to ensure the interoperability. And so Dash as a delivery framework is certainly one step towards that. And um, to fully go the full distance, you know, we provide a range of test vectors and test files that have uh, Dolby audio formats, um, both for the live profile and on-demand profile. So our partners can actually test, you know, real-world content with audio and video as well um, against that. And so we've distributed those to around 500 companies at this point, um, not all of which, of course, will necessarily adopt Dash, but we've made it available to all our partners and licensees to ensure that to the extent they do head down um, a path to adopt Dash, that there's more consistency in the, uh, in the performance. So that's, those are good data points, and, and I think I want the audience to understand where we are today and where this thing's going to go in 6 to 12 months. And you touched on some things. We talked about test content and, and devices that can, can render this stuff. Where are we as an industry with regard to supporting this? I mean, obviously Qualcomm's got to put Dash in their, in their chips that go into the phones, and you've got player components. You've got, you know, server and delivery components. A lot of it's there, but there are still some pieces that, that are yet to be uh, commoditized or seen in, in the mass market. So, Godfather, over to you. What's the status there? <laughs> First, I'm not the Godfather. <laughs> um, um, it's um, uh, where we are with Dash. It's, the good news is that we don't need to sell Dash to industry. Everybody who is in the streaming uh, uh, media business. Everybody who is doing a streaming uh, is convinced that we need one comprehensive standard that deliver the experience to the user. And it has a global reach, universal reach, device reach, and it becomes faster, easier, uh, more um, platform in terms of features. Um, lots of activity going on in terms of vendors. If you look at, for instance, Dash Promoters Group or Dash IF, we have something like 47 companies participating. We have, every week we have activity going on. People, test vectors, we are developing Dash 264 interop, uh, interoperability point implementation guidelines. Um, and um, also when you look at cross industry in Europe, uh, in US, different consortiums are adapting um, uh, Dash as a part of their specification, their recommendations. In fact, um, I haven't been in any meetings that I have to go and justify why you need to do Dash. The question is, what do I need to implement from Dash? What is the interoperability uh, point? Whether it provides all the features I need and when services, devices would be available. So I think we're going to hear a lot um, during next year we already heard companies supporting Dash. Adobe has announced the, the Dash support in the platform. Microsoft has this year announced that we're going to support our Dash in our Windows Azure Media Services and uh, other products. Um, the question is really when and when it's going to have a universal reach in the sense that enough number of devices, um, enough encoders, encoding tools, workflow tools, and of course people deploying um, I'm very optimistic, maybe not because I'm very involved. I've been involved in different standards, and um, um, to me it seems this is the fast paced, uh, fastest paced um, standards in terms of adoption so far. Um, look at H.264 ABC, how many years it took the industry adapted. Impact 2, how many years it took adapted, and look at the momentum behind Dash. So can you can, please. Of the, the key to what Raj is talking about is interoperability. I think uh, one of the things that we did with H.264, we, with the MPEG Industry Forum, which is a, almost a precursor to the MPEG Dash Industry Forum, we did nine rounds of interoperability testing. And it, it, because we found in MPEG 2, all the way back, set top box certain streams coming from certain encoders, all kinds of interop issues. So one of the things that I think Raj has pioneered with Thomas Stockhammer 
is the concept of a subset of Dash that is going to be what we focus on for interrupt testing initially. And it's called Dash 264. And I think that's a key thing for you, for you guys to take away with you. Dash 264 is critically important because that's the kind of nucleus of where we, you know, we're, we're doing the interrupt testing. And it's what's going to really enhance the, the, the rate of adoption. By the way, there are going to be a Dash 264 session right after lunch. So if you want to know the details of it, please attend that session. So let's dive into that, actually. Um, so David just mentioned uh, something called Dash 264, which is uh, a simplification of the profiles, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but let's educate the audience. What is Dash 264? Um, I mean, what does it specify? How does it make things simpler? Are there trade-offs? Um, I want to have a separate discussion about the different profiles and, and why they were created, but let's talk to the audience about Dash 264 and, and the benefits. I can start. Cool. Sure. <clears throat> I, I'm not the technical, so I'll let Dave and, and Iraj really dig in on it, but I think when you think about any standard uh, across the board, whether it's adaptive bitrate or H.264 or um, anything, the 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 one great thing about a proprietary protocol, um, I'm just going to use our own RTMP just as, an, just as a baseline. The one really nice thing about that protocol is if you have one company focused on that one initiative and, and is successful as Adobe was to drive that, um, then you can be fairly certain as a function of that, everybody's going to be doing the same thing, right, because you've licensed the software. Um, when you deal with a standard that describes how to do everything, Right, including the kitchen sink, you really need to, as an industry, focus in on one single area so that everybody can be proficient and contribute in a focused way. So frame the problem of uh, how do I create the fragments? How do I deliver the fragments, the networks and the cell towers? Those are very, very hard problems that a lot of people are thinking about in a very focused way. From Dash 264's point of view, it describes very, very... Um, um, definitively, um, what the pieces of the puzzle are. And so everybody can focus in on that. There's a lot of other things that Dash includes, but Dash 264, and if we rally behind that, then broadcasters and operators and encoding vendors and CDNs and OVPs, everywhere down the chain is focused on one problem and one solution. And that's, that's kind of the hopes of, of focusing on the Dash 264. I'll, I'll let you guys go on the technical details, though. Well, it's... Um Obviously, not a, a wild stretch of the imagination to work out which or a video codec is in Dash 264. Um, that, but the, the, the key other selection in Dash 264 um, it was the selection of the transport stream, the ISO um, transport stream, which is vital to allow um, ease of use by multiple devices and multiple DRMs effectively in the same pipe. That, uh, that those are two, I think, key elements, Iraj, aren't they, of the Dash 264? And, of course, there's other things as well which are se selections because Dash as itself is very wide. It's uh, to the point of, of being the corner cases involved in interrupt testing would be just too much for it to really accelerate in, uh, adoption. So that's why we decided to, to, to take a, a stab at defining an adoption profile that was going to be the center of our interrupt testing. Um, two points I would add. One is that Dash 264 also being used as a framework for other consortiums to adopt the solution. So it's helping aligning all different consortia's recommendations. If everybody stays in that framework, they can add additional constraints, which they are doing. It, it, it enables interoperability between different solutions in different markets with different uh, applications and use cases. The other um, point I want to add is that in terms of defining what additional, we are defining common encryption parameters, we are defining um, subtitles and closed captions formats for it. So it's basically a vertical protocol stacks for all you need for deliver uh, multimedia using a streaming. Dash itself, MPEG Dash, is just the uh, system part the file format and segment format part and the manifest part, uh, Dash 264, in addition to those, added video codec, audio codec, common encryptions, and subtitles. Therefore, the streams you get is the streams that basically you can play on a client 
and make sure that if your client plays that those streams, it compliant and with Dash 264, you can build the entire experience using that. You don't need any additional parts. Okay. So let's pull the curtain back a little bit and explain to people, I guess we said we're going to regress. Um, so it sounds like, and I'm all oversimplified, but it's called Dash 264 best practice. Um, but let's also talk about how the standard was ratified. And you know, if there are people in the audience who, who are, you know, hear that there's six different profiles, okay, which one works in which scenario? Um, but let's walk them through why the standard was ratified with, you know, three ISO MP4 um, specifications and three for MPEG-2, you know, without scaring people, let's explain to them what the different use is for these different profiles. Um, since we've just told them that Dash 264 kind of simplifies this and, and you know, applies a best practice approach. So, Araj, we'll start with you. So, a standardization is, of course, a collaborative effort. When you have 60 companies, 90 people attending and trying to come up with the best technical solutions, of course, you get a lots of proposals. You get a lots of use cases. And you try to come up with the specifications that address every possible use case. Uh, you don't want to standardize a small piece of it and add to it because then it becomes a moving target. Then people don't know what it is. And the profile practicing in MPAC always been that define enough number of profiles uh, depending on what being proposed for different and main, main use cases. Getting six profile out of a standard is nothing unusual in MPAC practice. Um, uh, if we look at previous standards, a video codec like uh, AVC gets several profiles. I don't remember even the number. I think it's more than 10. Um, um, same thing with MPEG-2 um, even. Uh, uh, and MPEG-4 went to up to 30 profiles or so, 29 profiles last time I uh, counted. Um, now, yeah, profiles provide flexibility in terms of how you can deploy it and what solutions you can deploy. It. In the real practice, history has shown that um, industry always focused on few main use cases and come up with the solutions that uses a couple of profiles with the specific configurations. Sooner industry converges on that set, the adoption is going to happen faster and probably going to achieve easier. The cost of deployment would be lower. And that's why I think the value Dash IF is adding is that trying to reach that point of interoperability faster possible. Try to not have a lots of permutations that goes, people deploy, and then they see they have different options, doesn't work with each other, and they basically compete in the market, and a few of them become dominant. So um, now, um, your uh, question was about what are these profiles? So. Um, the original concept of uh, the streaming was basically we have on-demand applications and live applications. We have MPEG-2 um, transport streams and ISO-based media file format streams, and we basically define profile for those. We have two of the two profiles defined for MPEG-2 transport streams. Um, one of them, in fact, is designed to be a migration path for, for, from uh, solutions like HLS to uh, Dash. The ISO-based media file format one are popular and strong because they pro provide a, uh, a solution based on fragmented MP4 file. It's very flexible in terms of the cost of the creation content, being able to combine audio and video tracks, being able to combine video with, with different languages. It provides a very flexible, uh, reduced number of files, content, and a flexible delivery. So those become popular. And we had a company like Netflix attending, wanted to do a simple on-demand delivery. So we had that on-demand ISO-based profile for that effect. We have companies like Microsoft and others attending that live streaming was a big um, uh, deployment case for them. So the live ISO-based media live profile basically was designed for that. And um, again, it goes back to how industry adapts any of these profiles and we're trying to avoid confusions by prescribing a set of, a combination of actually two of these profiles, on-demand and the live ISO-based media <coughs> profile and dash IF. 
I think the, the big gorilla in the room here is what, um, what we find Apple will do. Um, if they eventually adopt uh, Dash, then I think all these other kind of options and, not, and profiles and will we'll start to disappear and we'll just coalesce around one. Um, are they going to do that? Well, it, it, I can't see a reason for them to do it, to be honest, because the idea of going to an ISO transport stream is all about multiple DRM capability, and that's not in their interest, so why should they? However, we have seen over the past uh, year or so progressive improvements in HLS uh, that have kind of made it uh, adopt certain of the features that make Dash such, attractive, such an attractive uh, profile. So I think we'll probably, as an industry, end up with two standards, two uh, standards. We've lived with that before um, in television. Um, and, but I think that, will, that the Dash side of things will, will very quickly coalesce around, around what I hope was going to be the Dash 264. Okay. So, John, I think you were the first to mention Netflix, and Iraj just mentioned them as well. Um, and there have been some events that have used Dash as a foundation. So can you talk to the audience about people who have, that you know who've deployed Dash, where it's in use today? Obviously, like we said, Netflix was like first person in the pool. But what else has been done using Dash today that these people can use as a reference or go back and, you know, show the boss? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a that's a good question. So, so yeah, Netflix, you know, from from our perspective, has certainly been one of the early leaders. Um, in terms of companies planning Dash, um, I think like the other folks have said, um, when Kevin kicked it off, uh, you know, virtually every content partner we meet with for for adaptive streaming, you know, Dash is a question they bring up. Of you know, hey, we're doing HLS today, or, or we're doing you know smooth streaming today, and we're looking at Dash, and it looks like that's where things are going. Um, so, so our expectation is there will, there will start to be a wave of, of folks using it when there's more robust support. Um, in terms of how that unfolds, um, you know, certainly from the European perspective with our, our teams there, um, they're seeing a lot of interest with the broadcast community with TNT 2.0 in France. Um, looks like this year could, could really kick in. Um, HVB TV 1.5 is becoming more of a reality. Um, we recently did a tour in, in uh, Asia talking to the OEMs and the silicon providers and um, you know, they're kind of nodding their heads saying, yes, we get it, this is coming. We need to build you know, capability in, in our products to make, make it happen. So it, you know, our, our perception is it's still early days, um, but in the coming years, some services coming to market. Right. Sure, please. Um, I, I, I think we echo that. Um, one of the, sort of like, uh, do you remember back when XML was introduced? Who remembers that? And I remember, this is before I worked for Adobe, but we used to get people coming into our office saying, we want to build our whole site in XML. <laughs> right? And I think no one really quite understood what that actually meant. And we, we had a lot of conversations, um, even just this morning, around what does support mean? Right? Hey, I want to build my whole site in MPEG Dash. That's, that's great. What does it take to do that? And, and what does it take to think about how do you change the workflows and change your content prep and change your monetization and change your protection? Do you need to do any of that? How do we rally behind something that we can all sort of contribute to? Um, I think support is a really key question. I think there's a call to the industry now where we have, with the promoters group or Dash IF, really set a mark in the sand to say, here's a really good option to allow people to simplify those workflows and ultimately reduce the cost so ultimately we can put more content online. Because that's the real barriers. Right now you've got four formats, right, multiple devices. How can we do that? Demonstration is key. We saw some great stuff. There was some stuff with the Olympics this year, um, some really great experiments. I think the more that we as a broadcast community, both vendors as well as other, can create situations that we can publicly demonstrate the viability of this within the device landscape as well as on the desktop, then those examples and those demonstrations are going to be really great to start hardening the support, which means... How do you make sure encoders, when they fail or if they don't fail, or clouds when they work, when they don't work, or backup when they work or don't work, all the systems are in place. Within Adobe, we're, we're, we're looking at um, our format, which is the HDS format, evolving into a Dash uh, format. But we're solving problems of today, of how do we make sure that you can deliver high-quality, resilient live streams over the Internet today. 
right? That's a problem of right now. We need to extend that into Dash as an industry. And broadcasters, you know, you guys need to help us, the vendors, be able to demonstrate that and provide us, you know, Raj's use cases is use cases of and examples of how we can get this to work and give us the opportunities to prove it out so that we can, as a vendor ecosystem or a platform ecosystem, give, uh, give the industry something that we can actually build on and give you something that it will work. But we need to work collaboratively. It's not something that, you know, we have to work behind closed doors. You know, you're going to have one broadcaster working with another broadcaster, one cable operator working with another cable operator. You know, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. And I think we need to do that if we're going to get out of this rat hole of multiple formats. And if we're going to have one format evolve as the format to move forward. So I think we've done a great job this year. We've got awareness out. You know, we're not sort of spelling out what Dash is anymore. I think now it's to the point of let's get the evidence in place for the next 12 months. Let's find those opportunities where we can actually demonstrate this great work that everybody's doing. I'm Kevin Towns, and I approve this message. Yes. <laughs> Vote for Question in the back. Go ahead. Uh, repeat the other. Go ahead. Repeat the question. Um, what are the risks to adoption? Is it Apple? Is it competing formats? Is it device manufacturers? Is it the uh, you know the market readiness? The, yeah, the marketplace. Um, what could prevent this from moving at the pace that we expect it to? Well, one thing I think is a, a risk. Some some people are very keen <clears throat> to go ahead ahead of any um, interoperability rounds. So we're working with. Actually, with Qualcomm, and we've been working with them on their Snapdragon devices, so delivering um, Dash streams, and they confirm the compliance, etc. It works. But if that becomes um, something that is a branch, if you like, of of, uh, of Dash, then then I think, and we find then another operator will use it slightly different, etc. We'll end up with multiple. I think I use Will's term, and ninety-five percent. Compatible, except 100% incompatible, right? And that, that's something that I think would be uh, we need to, as an industry forum, we need to accelerate our work in interoperability and really get people like you guys aware of Dash 264 as early as possible. And then I think the industry will start to to come together much quicker, and it won't have the branches, which is what I'm scared of. But unfortunately, people are out there; they want this now. That they see the value of of Dash today. And they don't necessarily have the luxury of being able to wait for us to be able to have, as an industry, a good, solid interrupt basis. I think efforts like what John is doing at Dolby are critical, providing specimens that people can test against. And these common specimens of audio or video it or... Sounds a bit incredible. medical, that. It does. I'm sorry, I can't think of another word. Test vectors. Stuff. Test cases. Okay. Vectors, yeah. Vectors. Test vectors of innovation. Um, videos. We'll just call it videos. Don't say beaker. <laughs> and, and, those, and those test cases are available to, to all partners. And, you know, you don't have to be a Dolby licensee, for example, to, um, to get access to them. And, you know, I think the more examples of that out there, the better. So I'm going to go into the religion and politics part of this discussion. David touched on it, but Apple and Disney have been notable absentees in the Dash Party. So given the adoption of HLS in various corners of the industry, um, to include the operators, not just streaming people, um, you know, let's talk to these folks about why they should consider Dash. I mean, a lot of people say, well, HLS is good enough, and to your point, David, they seem to, to iterate on it and give the industry the features that they require. Um, but what, what, would, what do we tell the broadcaster, what do we tell the operator um, is the benefit, or, or is it, like you mentioned, maybe just a two-horse race and we're going to have to we're end up at that? Well, when, they, when you look at it, um, if you do go and adopt HLS, you're already giving one of your keys to your kingdom away. The DRM is now out of your control. Um, that's the key benefit to, to broadcasters. Anyone who has rights to content doesn't necessarily want to throw away those rights. They want to be able to use those to the best advantage. So controlling their DRM is essential, which is why you need the ISO format to, for the transport. Um, and that's, that's, I think, one of the biggest justifications for not going the HLS route. It's also about industry collaboration, right? So HLS is owned and operated by Apple, right? That's not a mystery. Others, there's been other interpretations of that format, which is great. But the, 
the, the notion that we have a platform here where we have a lot of smart people who can contribute a variety of use cases into one thing makes a ton of sense, right? So we're not beholden to one company uh, defining sort of the video format of the future. It's an industry defining it. Can I add something? So HLS, many people say that it's a standard. It's not even a standard. It's um, at the best is informational draft submitted to IETF. If you look at the number of versions today has, I just look at it yesterday, it's up to version 10. Every six months, a new draft gets submitted because the draft is valid for six months. It's an informational draft. And if you look at this draft, uh, 10 versions do different differences. Every version has a, a few new um, um, features. Um, so the question becomes that, first of all, you are tailing a moving target. Um, the fate of that the specification is in the end of the one company. Collaborations allows everybody provides the input. Collaborations that international standards allows that um, you design the next versions based on what it's needed as a, for the whole industry. The second thing is that you don't design every six months, you don't come with a new version in the standards. You try to finalize the standards, keep it for a few years, so make the market solid and stable. People can build services and applications and, and solutions on that. Um, and um, so, um, uh, and even Apple participated in dash standardization. So in terms of um, te technological advantages, DRM is one of the advantages in um, uh, for Dash. There are several other advantages, and in fact, one of the reasons HLS have multiple versions, at least my view, is that it's um, they are doing a catch-up game in terms of adding features that Dash can already support. The truth is, of course, HLS is out there. There are lots of <coughs> devices out there. Dash has a challenge of having enough number of devices, having enough workflow tools, having services and um, encoding tools available so it becomes a viable, uh, deployable solutions compared to something that exists out there. And this is a challenge for the in that whole industry. It's not just for the vendors. It's not just for the broadcast. Everybody has to work with each other to make that happen. Okay. Um, let's finish with this. What should these folks expect to see in the industry in terms of Dash between now and, say, Stream Media East next spring in New York? Will we see uh, events being done, or we see more support, you know, on the encode side or on the delivery side? What's what? What can we expect in six months? I think it's that. This is my crystal ball. I'll revisit <laughs> back in May. Um, you can replay it back and see what the predictions are. Um, I think there'll be an MPEG Dash logo or Dash two six four logo on every encoder device, um, leaving the manufacturing or software uh, centers. I think. Um, most CDNs will support Dash. I think um, OVPs and, and workflow uh, management systems and CMS systems will support Dash. I also think that um, we will have some really good examples out there of performance of Dash relative to um, RTMP or HDS or, or Smooth or, or RTMP, where we're actually starting to, to see broadcasters do it. Um, I also think that we will meet some challenges along the way of, of you know, what may or may not be available in Dash that we'll need to rethink, but that will be a group think. But I think at NAB next year or at Streaming Media East next year, we'll mm -hmm. see quite a few more uh, representations of Dash that should make broadcasters feel a lot more comfortable that people are thinking about their best interest. Um, my next well, I think under the uh, next um, Obama administration, Dash 264 <laughs> will be mandatory. Um, he, went, uh, he went there. <laughs> <laughs> but I, th I think we will see and hear now, we will hear operators. Currently, we're working with a lot of operators around the world. Um, uh, they're keeping their, you know, their light under a bushel. Right? And, and I think we'll see over the next, uh, through 2013, a lot of these becoming more public and quite big names and quite big deployments. And I think uh, it will see some splinters, uh, especially the early adopters, but I think it will coalesce around Dash 264 if we do our interrupt testing as quickly as we can. So if Romney is elected, do we repeal Dash? <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs>
<laughs> Anyone else? Uh, I mean, just, just to echo uh, what, what's been said, I mean, we're hearing from our partners that they're definitely committed to Dash. Um, they're moving forward. We've been working, you know, on getting, making sure we have the test vectors ready for them. So it, it definitely looks in the next six months, you know, you're starting to see, you're going to see a lot more workflow tools um, in the market ready to go. And as John said before, I think you're going to hear more Dash deployment. You're going to see more Dash deployment in Europe than U.S. in the next six months. You may not hear it as Dash deployment. You may hear it as TNT and HPBTB, but uh, the engine inside for uh, streaming is Dash. Uh, in U.S., of course, you're going to see more announcements. I think you're going to see lots of more device announcements. So we, we're going to see a start in terms of the market adoption, in terms of the availability of the devices, more devices be available. But it's not going to happen overnight, six months, not going to be millions or hundred millions of devices in the next three months. You have to be a little bit more patient. Can I just add on to that? Because I think it's a really important point is, you know, I've been in a lot of meetings where Dash is hailed as sort of the savior of video. <laughs> um, it may be. But it's going to take a while. And you know, we've got some history uh, that demonstrates over the last five years how long it takes to adopt things. I brought up H.264 in a 10-year cycle. <clears throat> um, in our experience at Adobe, it's been RTMP dynamic streaming, RTMP-E, HTTP dynamic streaming. Um, you know, these things typically, in our history, have taken between three to four years. Right, so we're in the early, early days. We, you know, people are aware of it; they understand it. Now we got to kick the tires. Um, it's not just change the format; it's change everything in between, the way you package, the way you encrypt, the way you content manage, the way you analyze and, and, and advertise against it. All of those things have to be worked through, and that's not an overnight thing. So it's it's now to a point of let's get some some demos out there. Let's let's. Um, let's take that next big step. But we have been doing this for quite some time. I mean, we, Ericsson, pioneered this stuff way back in 3GPP. Remember, that's the origins of everything we're talking about now. So it's, it's been around for a while, so it's about time we came out as an industry and started really implementing it. And I think you're going to see deployment. Mm -hmm. You're going to see products. I agree with uh, Kevin uh, that it's going to take a while. This is one of the cases I believe is faster than other standards. Um, it's not gonna, or still it's not gonna happen overnight, but it's not gonna be five years. I, I'm much more hopeful that it's gonna happen much in much faster, shorter time. I think the proof point there, Iraj, is, uh, is making sure that we demonstrate the real value. Correct. Right? If I make money from my video, right. can I sell this video? Can I protect it? Can I, um, can I actually see a reduction in my deployment costs? And Those are the proof points. And, and, and always it costs them. But I want to also echo what uh, Kevin said earlier. I want to challenge the broadcast industry. Lots of vendors are already in Dash IF working toward building the solution. Um, I would like to challenge <coughs> broadcast industry to come and provide use cases. Ask, how are you going to implement this for me? How I, how I can deploy this deployment use cases? How am I going to build? And we're going to show it to, it to you. That's a way to proofing. Um, the solutions we are doing, the vendors implementing what's really needed for the industry to deploy a Dash. Great. Well, with that, I thank you for coming. I hope the uh, session's been informational. Uh, join me in thanking our panelists, and I hope you have a great day.